Yeah, so the recording should be going. So let's get into it. Uh, so on Monday, we talked about naming compounds. So we worked on that. And we're going to continue to work on that today. And then hopefully we can uh, move past that and get into um, how to determine the weight of compounds. Just as a reminder, uh, tests next week, Friday. Um, and all the material that will be covered in the test can be found in the test one folder. All right, so we ended up on this slide where we named our polyatomic compounds. So next thing we're gonna look at is hydrated compounds or hydrates. And a hydrated compound simply means that the compound has water surrounding it. And we name the compound based on how many waters there are. And here I have our prefixes, hemi, mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, octa. And it goes on from there. All of, it, all, all of that is, is just how many waters. So we put this prefix in front of the word hydrate to tell us how many waters there are. So for our compound down here, BACL2, well, to name this, this is an ionic compound. So we have to name that via our ionic compound naming rules. If we look for barium on the periodic table, it's in the second column. Anything in the second column has a fixed charge, so we don't need Roman numerals. We just call them barium. The nonmetal is chlorine, so we just add I to it to make a chloride. And this dot, 6H2O, what that means is that every time you find this barium chloride molecule, it will be surrounded by six waters. So this whole compound then is barium chloride hexahydrate. The ionic compounds barium chloride and it's surrounded by six hydrates, hexahydrate. All right, so what I want you to do is I want you to um, either write the formula of uh, for A and C. And then for B and D, I want you to give me the names. Um, I have the uh, polyatomic ion list on the right. Remember that you're gonna have to know when it comes to test time. So I hope you're um, reviewing that. Um, and yeah, let's get started. And I know some of these are cut off at the bottom. So I'll rewrite what's cut off at the bottom now. So see if you can't name these compounds or give me the molecular formula. As always, if you have questions, please do not hesitate to ask.
And also, if you like to check answers, if you have an answer and you're not sure if it's right, also feel free to send me a message for that as well. All right, since we're a little behind, um, I'm gonna cut down the uh, time a little bit and just go uh, into the answers here. So the first thing we have is cobalt to phosphate. Um, so we go to our periodic table and we see that the element cobalt has the symbol CO. And we're saying it's plus two because that's what the Roman num numeral two means. It's with a phosphate, PO4, 3 minus. And remember, you have to combine these in such a way that when cobalt and phosphate um, come together, the overall charge is zero. So like we saw on Monday, uh, the easiest way to do that when you have different charges is just to cross multiply. So I would have three cobalts for every two phosphates. And then I need to put a dot here. This dot is uh, for my hydrate compounds. It's octahydrate. So octa is eight H2O. So that's cobalt two phosphate octahydrate. B, we're just looking to name that. So that is beryllium. chloride dihydrate for two waters. C, chromium three phosphate trihydrate. So again, that chromium, which is CR, that three is meaning it's plus three. We saw on A, that phosphate is minus three. So if you were to cross multiply that, you'd get three chromium and three phosphates. But since they're the same charge, you can just put one, right? Having three of chromium and three of phosphate is the same as having one of chromium and one of phosphate. Just divide each by three and you'll get a whole number. So that's chromium, phosphate, trihydrate. So three water. And then D, our metal is lithium. Lithium is in column one. So no, no Roman numerals needed. NO2 nitrite. So this is lithium nitrite monohydrate. Um, some people would just put hydrate uh, just for the sake of like, you know, keeping it the same as A, B, and C. Uh, I, I'm going to put monohydrate just so you know there's one water there. All right. So does anyone have any questions about naming water compounds or um, anything at all? Any questions whatsoever? All right, then we can move on then to now molecular compounds. So molecular compounds, if you remember, only have covalent bonds. And molecules that only have covalent bonds are made exclusively of nonmetals. So when we're looking at molecular compounds, it's compounds that only have nonmetals in them. If you see a metal, then you're working with an ionic compound and we use the ionic compound naming. However, for molecular compounds, it's the naming scheme's kind of easy in that 
you just name each element and you have a prefix for how many atoms of that element is present in the molecule. And then the last element just becomes ID. You, you end the name of the last element with ID. So our prefixes are the same as the ones we use for water. So um, they're the same in both cases. So once you learn it for one, you know it for the other. So let's look at some examples. Ni3, nitrogen and iodide is, or iodine rather, is are both nonmetals. So the name is nitrogen triiodide. So you might be wondering to yourself, why isn't it mononitrogen triiodide? Um, mononitrogen triiodide is correct. Mostly though, um, people drop off mono and don't use it, um, but you can. So if you're wondering, just to be safe, should I put mono in front of things with just one? That's perfectly fine with me if you want to call this mononitrogen triiodide. But most chemists would just call it nitrogen triiodide. Same thing with phosphorus pentachloride. One phosphorus, five chlorines, so that's where the penta comes from. Then the ide for chlorine turns into chloride. Then this uh, interesting molecule, P4S10. So we have four phosphorus atoms, so that's tetra, 10 sulfur molecules, that's deca. And since it's sulfur, and it's the last molecule, it's termed sulfide. So this is tetraphosphorus decasulfide. So with that, you can name any molecular compound in the world um, following this logic. And with this, I always like to tell, tell a story. Um, so in California, and I wanna say in the late 90s at like the California State Fair, uh, there was a fourth grader or fourth or fifth grader, something like that, uh, doing a science project for a science fair and she was testing scientific literacy. And she was trying to get the compound uh, dihydrogen monoxide band. Because if you look at dihydrogen monoxide, um, it's in baby food, um, it's in our pipes, it's also in toxic waste that's extremely poisonous to us. Um, so it's in a lot of bad, like really bad uh, uh, molecules or, or chemicals, right? Um, if you get the steam, if you breathe in steam dihydrogen monoxide, you will die. Um, you can also drink this and you can die as well. Um, so it's really bad. And she was trying to get the state of California to ban dihydrogen monoxide. And at the state fair, she got like 20 to 30,000 signatures to try and ban dihydrogen monoxide. Well, hopefully now that we went over this, you can realize dihydrogen monoxide is the um, chemical name for water. So hopefully if you ever find yourself in that situation after today's lecture, you won't fall for the same trap and try to get water banned. Anyways, that's just a fun little aside about chemical names. So with that, let's try and answer these questions for number five. Uh, for A through D, what is the formula? And E through H, give me the name. Yeah, I hope, I hope that student won like first place at our science fair, just showing uh, the, the scientific awareness of the general public um, probably needs to be improved if you're trying to ban dihydrogen monoxide. But anyways, um, yeah, let's take a couple minutes to do this. If you have questions, let me know. Um, if you want to check your answers with me, I'll let me know as well.
we'll do like another minute or so. Um, I know I'm rushing a little bit compared to normal, um, but hopefully at least the molecular compounds are a lot easier um, than the ionic compounds. The hardest part is probably just finding them on the periodic table. All right, so let's get into this. So A, we have phosphorus trichloride. So since there's nothing in front of phosphorus, that means it's mono. So phosphorus trichloride, PCO3. Thing, same thing with chlorine, chlorine monoxide. So you can see usually how the naming system goes. If the first element is mono, you usually drop it. If the second element is mono, uh, you usually have it. So chlorine monoxide, chlorine monoxide, CLO. Disulfur tetrafluoride. So di is two. So disulfur is S2. Tetrafluoride. Tetra is four. So four fluoride. Then phosphorus pentafluoride. So pentagram has five points. So phosphorus pentafluoride is five fluorines. So that's looking at the names and figuring out our, our uh, symbols. So let's do the other side now. E is a molecule you've heard many times. That would be carbon monoxide. The thing that can poison you. Once you take biochemistry, I will tell you why it why it will poison you and kill you on a molecular level. But for now, we just need to know it is carbon monoxide. F nitrogen. Try iodide, and I don't know how to spell that. I think there might be only one I. Um, kind of like how carbon monoxide just combines the O, but nitrogen triiodide. G, silicon, that's what SI is, silicon. Then we have four chlorines, so tetra chloride. There is two eyes. What do you know? I'm going to guess there was only one. I guess I should uh, trust my gut on that one. All right. The last one is four nitrogen, so tetra nitrogen. Then we have another tetra, tetra. And SE is selenium or selenide, tetra selenide. So the trick, if there is a trick to this, is just simply realizing when you have a molecular compound and when you have an ionic compound, right? So remember, molecular compounds, nonmetals only. When it's only nonmetals, it gets prefixes. And then for ionic compounds, is a metal plus a nonmetal. And depending on the metal, you either have Roman numerals or not. But ionic compounds don't get prefixes. So that's the big distinct, distinction there. Molecular compounds, prefixes. Ionic compounds, no prefixes. All right, any questions about naming up to this point? Right. 
let's move on then. Now comes something that is much more confusing than naming molecular compounds. A thing that always trips up students and one of the things I see most wrong on test one. So um, yeah, make sure, make sure you study this. And that is how to name acids. First, what is an acid? Uh, acids have two main definitions in chemistry. Um, we're gonna go with the simplest definition for right now. And in Gen Chem 2, that's when you get like the other definition. But an acid simply releases a proton in water. The, it releases an H plus in water. And for example, hydrochloric acid made of HCl, when that is put into water, it releases an H plus and a Cl minus. We call this ionizing. So when you put an ionic compound in water, it will break apart into its components, its cation and its anion. That's called ionization. The symbols AQ next to our elements, AQ means aqueous. That means we are in water and these molecules are just surrounded by water at all times. So whenever you see AQ, that means we're in water and our compounds are surrounded by water. So acids, one of the special properties of an acid is that they can dissolve metals and they're generally sour. So lemons, very acidic. Your own vomit, uh, incredibly sour and incredibly acidic. Like the pH of your stomach is like a pH of one or two, um, which is enough to like melt away metals. So you have that power inside your stomach if you would want to. I don't know why you would want to though. Okay, so how do we name our acids? So we have two types of acids and that's shown on the bottom left there. We have our binary acids. Remember binary is just two elements. So hydrochloric acid is a binary acid. And we have our oxy acids. These are acids that contain oxygen, right? And the first naming scheme we're gonna look at is our binary acids because they're super simple. Binary acids, you just name them hydro, then the name of the nonmetal, and you add ic to it, acid. That's why I kept calling HCl hydrochloric acid. Is that why people get ulcers? So generally inside your stomach, you have a, um, a mucus layer that protects your stomach from your, your own acid. Uh, what can happen due to disease or stress is that this mucus layer gets thinner, thinner or non-existent. And then you start digesting your own stomach. And in essence, that's kind of what an ulcer is. That's kind of a simplified view. Um, that's also why I find it funny when I go to the grocery store and I see like the very basic water, like pH nine water, basic water costs $3 a gallon. It's supposed to be healthier for you. Um, anyone who drinks that, be aware that your stomach has a pH of one or two. So at, at, as soon as you drink basic water, it's gonna be neutralized before you, you absorb it into your body. So if you have a tum ache, sure, drink basic water and it might help. Otherwise, don't waste your money. That's my, that's my consumer tip for the day, my consumer chemistry tip. Once you learn more about chemistry and biochemistry, it's, it's funny to see what advertisers put on their labels and like, once you learn more science, it's like, eh, I don't think it works that way. But anyways, that's an aside.
thumbs up. I don't know what that second icon is, but I'll take the thumbs up. All right. How about our oxy acids? How do we name those? So we already looked at our oxy anions uh, on Monday where we have this list of names. And the naming of oxy acids is just as confusing as naming the polyatomic ions. So let's try and get some logic into this system. Basically, the way it works is that if your oxy acid, if your polyatomic ion ends in eight. So if we look at for SO4, SO4 is sulfate. When that happens, you change the eight to ic acid. So a set of hydrogen sulfate, this is sulfuric acid. So I'm replacing, whoops, I, I underlined the wrong thing. Sulfate just right there. So you change that eight to ick. NO3 is nitrate. And so nitrate goes to nitric acid. Okay, so I ate ick. I don't know if that works. It's stupid. But if it makes you remember when I'm naming oxy, oxy acids, I ate ick, then maybe you can remember that if it ends in eight, it should be changed in ick. While if it ends in ite, it becomes an os, right? So NO2 is nitrite. That is nitrous acid. SO3 is sulfite. That's sulfurous acid. Is a big indication that it's an acid if there's a single H in front. Yes, um, not, not just a single H, but rather any H in front. So if we look at sulfuric acid, there's two hydrogens. So that's saying both of these hydrogens are acidic. Here there's one. That's not always the case when it comes to chemistry because this is called carboxylic acid. So that's also um, acidic. How to really tell is if you have um, just a hydrogen in any like non-metal, that's going to be an acid. Or if you have a hydrogen with our polyatomic ions, the way people write that is they do put it out front. So that's also going to be an acid. So that, that's what you need to be on the lookout for. We're not going to worry about cases where the hydrogen comes last right now. For Gen Chem 1, um, yes, the hydrogen, if there's a hydrogen in front, a lot of the times it means it's an acid. There are exceptions to that because, of course, there are. Um, for example, this compound is not an acid, but people would write it like that. Well, anyways, that's kind of a side. Short answer, yes. Hydrogen in front, usually you can assume it's an acid. All right. Now, let's, let's put this to the test. Our last naming is trying to name acids. Take a couple minutes, see if you can figure this out. Got questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'll be back in about two to three minutes um, with some answers.
All right, so hopefully you named a couple of them at least. So let's take a look at this. As I'm about to sneeze, so I'm going to mute for one second. OK, so first we have a binary acid because there's only two of them. So the way you name binary acids is you start with hydro. It's right there in the top right, hydro. Then it's fluorine. So this changed to fluoric acid. So those of you who are Breaking Bad fans, hydrofluoric acid is what they use to chop up people, you know, to melt people, I guess. Um, but technically in the uh, field of chemistry, hydrofluoric acid is a weak acid. It's really good at eating people, but um, it is technically a weak acid. All right, HCl, hydrochloric acid, right? Binary acid, so hydro. Then chlorine is chloric acid. Hydrobromic. Well, it's hydro, so we know it's a binary acid. Anything that starts with hydro is telling you it's an acid, and it starts with hydrogen. Bromic, so to get the root of that, just realize that you can chop off ick and just look at brome and figure out what this brome mean. So that's hydrobromic acid. All right, our next acid, phosphoric acid. Yeah, so the way to handle this is there's no hydro in front of it. Since there's no hydro, then it's not a binary acid. You know it's a polyatomic acid. And we have to figure out which polyatomic acid it is. So high phosphoric acid, so it ends in ick. So the base word must have an eight in it, right? Because I ate ick. And if we go down to our list, you would see phos Fate, so phos and phos, ick, eight, so it must be PO4. Yeah. Next, how many hydrogens do we put on it? Okay, so phos our, our phosphate is PO4, three minus. So as a negative charge of three. Hydrogen has a charge of plus one. You can remember this because on the periodic table it's in the first column, even though it's not a metal, it is a non-metal, but it does have a charge of plus one. So to have this balance out, I can just cross multiply. So I have three hydrogens for every one phosphate. There's phosphoric acid. All right, so HClO2, so it's more than two atoms, so it's not binary, so it's a polyatomic acid or an oxy acid. So if we go to our list, ClO2 ends in ite. Ite becomes os. This is chloros acid. And then the same idea with HNO3. NO3 is an eight, I ate ick. So this between becomes nitric acid, nitric acid, which is different than nitrose acid, different by one oxygen. All right, so I know the oxy acids um, can get a little confusing, um, but yeah, hopefully that explanation um, showed you some of the skills that I use uh, when I'm trying to determine the names of these molecules. Why do I put hydro in the last two? Because hydro only goes with binary acids. Once you have more than two types of uh, atoms, so for E, I, my types of atoms are hydrogen, chlorine, and oxygen. 
F, my types of atoms are hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. So for E and F, I have three types of atoms. Hydro only goes with binary acids, which is why for A, B, and C, the two types of molecules are H and F, H and Cl, H and Br. So those get the word hydro. D, E, and F don't because they're not binary. Any other questions? All right, with that, we finally end our naming PowerPoint and we're gonna get back to everybody's favorite subject, math. Because who doesn't love algebra? Let me pop that up. Two, 10. All right, so in the previous set of slides, we have just learned how to name any compound um, that we're probably gonna deal with here in general chemistry. Now that we got the naming down, the next thing we're gonna figure out is how much a mole of any compound weighs or what is the formula mass of that compound. And this is all done using the periodic table. So just some reminders what a mole is. When I say a mole, that is just 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. So if I have one mole of oxygen, I have that many atoms of oxygen, right? And what formula mass is, is what is the weight in grams of one mole of a substance, right? So if I had carbon monoxide and I wanted to figure out how many grams one mole of carbon monoxide weighs, I use the formula down there, um, uh, the formula mass formula. So you'll see this called formula mass. Um, I will often call it molecular mass or molecular weight. All of those words mean the same thing and people will use different things. Um, moving forward, just because the way I've been using these words for the last you know, decade now, I will probably not say formula mass. I will probably say molecular mass or molecular weight. Anyways, the way to calculate the molecular weight of any molecule is you figure out how many atoms are in that molecule. So that's the first thing we need, need to know. Then let's say we're doing this, this equation for H2O. I wanna know the number of atoms of the first element in my chemical formula. So H2O, I'm gonna say my first uh, atom is hydrogen. And so I have two hydrogens, which is shown down here, okay? What is the weight, the atomic mass of hydrogen? So I go to the periodic table and I find hydrogen. And under hydrogen, we have a number. Depending on your periodic table, it could be 1.008 or 1.01. .01. But that is the weight of one atom of hydrogen. So I'm gonna multiply those two together. And I'm gonna add that to the number of elements or number of atoms in my second element for H2O, my second element's oxygen. So I have one oxygen molecule multiplied by the weight of oxygen. So going back to your periodic table, could be 15.998 or 16, depending on which table you're looking at. We're gonna go with 16, so one, multiplied by 16. And you do this for however many types of atoms you have. Water, we only have two types of atoms, hydrogen and oxygen, so we're done. And we just do the math. 
2 times 1.01 .01 plus 16 equals 18.02. So the molecular weight of water is 18.02 grams per mole, or one mole weighs 18.02 grams. We also have another unit, atomic mass unit. This says one atom, or sorry, one molecule of water weighs 18.02 AMU, atomic mass units. Also, you might see this called the Dalton. They're the same thing. Two words for the same principle. Um, usually, when we calculate this, we care about grams per mole. There might be rare cases, though, we use AMU or the Dalton. It will be the, it's the same math. It's just you need to use different units for different problems. But like I said, mostly it will be grams per mole. Right. So the last thing we're going to do is um, let's just focus on A, B, and C. We'll do D, E, and F on Friday. But see if you can tell me what the molecular mass of nitrogen dioxide, lead four chloride, and calcium nitride are. So try and using your periodic table, figure out these. Um, and I will be back in a few minutes to uh, show you how it's done. Um, but yeah, try it on try it on your own first. So let's take a look at this. And for A and B, the first thing we need to do is just figure out what the formulas are. So nitrogen dioxide, since we're seeing these prefixes, we know it's a molecular compound. So nitrogen dioxide, so one nitrogen, two oxygens for dye. Then the molecular formula is 14.007 plus, so that's nitrogen, plus two times, we'll just say 16 
for oxygen. So two times 16 is 32. 32 plus 14 is 46. So this is 46.007 grams per mole. So that's nitrogen dioxide. B, lead four chloride. Okay, so lead has the symbol PB. And it's a metal and it's four. So it's saying this is plus four. Chlorine is a halogen. Chlorine always has a minus one charge. So lead four chloride would, has, would have the symbol lead with four chlorines. Right, so this, how to weigh this out is we find lead on the periodic table, 207.2, plus four times the weight of chlorine, which is 35.453. And I didn't calculate this out, so let me do that really quick. 207.2 plus four times 35.453, 349.012. grams per mole or AMU. Either, either unit works for me there. And then calcium with two NO3s. So let's weigh this out, calcium. The weight of one calcium is 40.078 plus, okay, we have two nitrogens because remember that, that two on the outside of the parentheses distributes inwards. So two times 14.007 plus, now we have six oxygens because we distribute that two Two times three is six, six oxygens, six times 16. Again, I'll do this really quick. So it's 40.078 plus two times 14.07 plus six times 16, 164092. So the weight of this, 164.092 grams per mole. So hopefully with A, B, and C, that shows you how we can use the periodic table to weigh any compound or know the molecular weight of any compound. On Friday, we'll continue with using that information um, to do some unit conversions like we've done like in week one or week two. So hopefully you still remember how to do that. Um, but are there any questions uh, people have? Where will we be taking our test? On Blackboard. It'll be under course content. Um, you, I don't know if I said it in this class, but you have 24 hours to take it. So um, next week, Friday at 12 a.m., it will appear then it will disappear at 11.59 p.m. You have 24 hours to take it. And I think I will be going with ProctorU as a way to make sure that everyone, to keep the integrity of the test and to make sure that the person signed up for the class is taking it. Um, I will have instructions about that and I will have a little walkthrough of how to set that up and I will give a little bit of extra credit for people who go through that walkthrough before the day of the test, but I, I will post all that in announcements. It's a lot thing. Yeah, so what it does is that it records you um, both via your camera and via your mic. So like I can watch you at any time, right? Um, and it also, uh, it doesn't lock your browser. I think you're, it might lock your browser, but I think you could still get past it. The only problem is um, it's recording everything on your screen at the same time and I have access to that too. So it's just a way to make sure that you're only looking at the Blackboard site. You're not talking to other people about the test and you're taking the test. 
uh, you have a time limit of an hour. So you start the test and you have an hour to finish it. So that's to prevent people from opening a test, like looking at it and be like, okay, I'm gonna go study these concepts and then go and answer the questions. Uh, no, it is not an open note test, not at all. I will be giving you an equation sheet. You can use that. But if I see things on the recording, like a cell phone or outside notes, stuff like that, that that's an automatic zero. So treat this like you would like a real test inside of a classroom. The only difference is, you know, you're taking it online. I will be putting up the periodic table I would like people to print out. Uh, do not write on that though. Um, if I see writing on that before the test begins, um, again, that would be something that uh, would call into academic integrity. So uh, you will you will be allowed scratch paper that will be blank to start with. Um, so you can use that to write on, but don't, don't bring like a periodic table that's not from Blackboard that has extra information and, and don't write on it. What about the conversions? Uh, you need to know those. You need to know how to do those. Like I'm not gonna give you a chart that says a milli is this, a micro is this, if that's what you're asking. Can we use a calculator? Yes, calculator is fun. Cannot use your phone as a calculator, but those calculators we mentioned at the very beginning of the class on the syllabus, those are fine. How many questions will there be? Uh, let's say 2,000. I'm just joking. I don't know, I haven't written it. I always like that question though, because what if I did say 2,000? Like. Maybe, maybe there will, maybe there will only be one question, one question with thirty-five parts. Let's say that. I probably won't write this till next week Wednesday, so um, I do not know. All right. Um, any other questions? Um, make sure you look at the tests on Blackboard from my previous years. So I'll give you a good indication of kind of what my tests look like. I will tell you it's not going to be all multiple choice. I kind of hate multiple choice. I really love short answer. I can really tell people's thought process that way. It takes me longer to grade, but since this is a, cl a small classroom, I can do that. All right. If nobody does have extra questions, or if you do, feel free to email me them. Otherwise, I will see people later, hopefully. Have a good one, everybody.